I am Tara Bradner, and this is Hopeful Hints, an infertility podcast where you will receive quick, hopeful hints to guide you through infertility. Here you will find education, inspiration, and most importantly, find peace as you walk through this journey to fulfill your family vision. Hi, I'm Tara Bradner, and this is Hopeful Hints, an infertility podcast, and this is episode one. I am so excited to be able to launch this podcast as a source of education and support in all of the things I wish I would have had on day one of being diagnosed with infertility. If you are new to learning all about Tara Bradner, I am a doctorate nurse practitioner turned fertility coach. After my own very long experience with infertility and coming out successful on the other end with a child, I realized huge gaps in care and support that were missing while I went through infertility. So I turned my hurt into hope for others and launched a nonprofit, the first and only infertility nonprofit in North Dakota and South Dakota. In addition, if 2020 did anything for me, it was make me realize where my passion and purpose in life truly lies, and that is helping those of you going through infertility all over the world. I want to be a source of support for everybody and make sure that you feel supported nurtured and have all the information at your fingertips when you are going through this diagnosis. So today's episode, I am going to tell you all about my journey through infertility and resources that I now offer and ways I support you while going through your journey through infertility. So let's get started. Our journey starts like many others when you are told to try to conceive on your own. Now, I did not have any reasons indicating that I would have troubles conceiving other than in 2007, I had a ruptured cyst during a laparoscopic procedure. They noted I had stage two endometriosis. They told me they cauterized it, took care of it, will not cause problems with conceiving in the future. I specifically asked that question. The only thing they were worried about when it came to conceiving was the way she removed the cyst and how she left the sac on my fallopian tube so that it wouldn't cause issues conceiving. So I really did not blink twice about the word endometriosis at that time. Fast forward, I got married and we decided at that time I was going to finish my master's and doctorate degree and then we were going to try for a family. So towards the end of that path, uh, when I was graduated, completing my doctorate degree, we started trying on our own. Approximately six months into this, I just felt like something wasn't right. Like my intuition was triggering me, my medical brain was going crazy on me. And so that December, we did meet with my OBGYN for a basic lab workup and an HSG. At that time, nothing was found. Everything was completely normal and We were encouraged to keep trying on our own. Sure enough, one month later, we were pregnant. I had my very first positive pregnancy test only to follow at six and a half weeks with a miscarriage. I remember distinctly, this is the point where like emotions or feelings that I wasn't used to or hadn't experienced before started. I felt alone yet confused like should I be grieving because it was only six and a half weeks but I felt sad but I was trying to like tell myself that it wasn't that far along I was trying to offset what I was feeling and justify why I should not be so sad about it yet I was sad and crying about it um typical male uh, I think (laughs) our husbands try so hard to be supportive and he was, he was supportive, but I remember him saying, it's okay, we'll just try again. Like, we'll just keep walking through this process. And I did not know who to go to. Like at that time, I think I had two friends that had experienced a miscarriage. And so I remember reaching out to one in particular and I did receive support. And so we picked up the next month, tried again. Two months in, after miscarriage of trying to conceive on our own again, 
I reached out to my OBGYN's office and I did not talk to her directly. I spoke to someone that worked for her and I distinctly, are you ready for this? Remember being told when you're crazy enough, call me back because you do know you have to come to the clinic multiple times a month if you're wanting to start any form of treatment for infertility or a workup for infertility. Now keep in mind, I live 120 miles from the closest medical facility that does reproductive care. And I was like, yes, I'm well aware. And I just was caught so off guard by saying call back when you're crazy enough because I actually had placed myself into counseling the month prior to help deal with these feelings I was having like grieving, not grieving, justifying, all the things. So to this day, I look back at that situation and see the lack of support on so many levels that I did not have or receive when experiencing a miscarriage. I truly, truly believe no matter how far along you were when you miscarried, this is a loss. And then we all need to acknowledge this more. I despise the word chemical pregnancy. That is a pregnancy. That is life. That was a baby. That is a loss. And we need to deal with these feelings that come with loss and miscarriage and followed by, in my case, infertility and what's to come. So I had, like I said, already been enrolled in counseling and I just cannot be more supportive of taking care of our mental health when going through infertility, but especially miscarriage. So fast forward, clearly this conversation caught me off guard. So I directly contacted my OBGYN after that comment was made and she immediately referred me to reproductive endocrinology and put me back into her care directly and with the reproductive endocrinologist. So May of 2016, we met with our first reproductive endocrinologist to come up with a plan. We decided that IUI was a good place to start as at that time I had the diagnosis of unexplained infertility. So my first IUI was June of 2016 with Femera and a trigger shot, followed by a negative pregnancy test. IUI number two, July 2016, Femera trigger shot fail. At this point, my medical monkey brain is running all over the place. There is still no diagnosis. So I finally speak up, I become my own advocate, and I ask, is there anything else we should be doing, testing, and adding to treatment? For IUI number three, I seriously feel like I could write an entire chapter of a book on this situation. So as I mentioned earlier, I am a doctorate nurse practitioner. I work in a rural community, and our hospital, clinic, nursing home, and ER is run by three of us nurse practitioners. At that time, it was two and a half of us because the third nurse practitioner was retiring. And we had what's called locum help or a individual who just comes temporarily to help us. And you know how timed these treatments are. And wouldn't you imagine I am supposed to be on call on the day I'm supposed to be driving. I found a clinic 90 miles and 120 miles to do my ultrasound and lab work to start our third IUI and I am on call. So mind you also at this time, I am not open about infertility, our journey, our loss, nothing, nobody. I work in a clinic of six people and I was not open to anybody about this. So here I am, first time having to share my diagnosis, and it's to a older male gentleman who was filling in at our clinic that week. And I asked him, I said, there's something I need to talk to you about. It's hard for me to explain, but I need to go to an appointment that is very timed. And as we got talking more, I opened up about what it was. And he shares with me that his daughter went through IVF. And the feeling I experienced that day was like no other. I was like, it was like weight was lifted off my shoulders. Not only that I could perhaps in that moment share more with him about what I had been through, but that I felt not alone. And just how connected we all are to somebody going through infertility. So thankfully he covered for me. I went and had my lab and ultrasound done and they were going to add gonal F injectables to this cycle. 
Now, I live in a rural community, and they were about to send the prescription to the pharmacy. And I said, no, can you send it here in the community where we're at? Because I don't think we'll be able to get that in. And the, the doctor argued with me. He's like, no, trust me, they can get it in. I said, no, I work there. I order prescriptions. I'm, I'm certain that this one, they will not be able to get in within two days. That was, that was the, the hang. He needed it in two days to start it. So he sends it anyway because he is adamant that my pharmacy will be able to get this medication within two days. So I drive 90 miles home, stop at the pharmacy right away, and have them look this up and check into it. Sure enough, they're not able to get it. Like, they cannot get it at all. It's a specialty medication they cannot get. So I instantly start panicking, call the reproductive clinic back, tell them what's going on. They look and look at the pharmacy in the community I just drove 90 miles from and say, okay, they'll be able to get it. We'll send it there. So I get back in the car, drive 90 miles back again, get to the pharmacy at 4.45 p.m. when they close in 15 minutes, and they proceed to tell me they can't get it in either. And I, at this point, like, lose it. Like, start crying because there's already hormones in our system that are all wonky, but... I'm like, you have to be kidding me. And I explain what's going on. And so they so kindly took the time to call the reproductive clinic back, get the information of an overnight pharmacy, send the prescription to that pharmacy, stayed after hours until the situation was taken care of. Get back in my car, drive home, and <clears throat> wait for this medication to arrive. So I finally get the medication. Things are going along smoothly. I, at that point, opened up about our journey because I had shared with our help out provider. And once again, it was getting hard to like hide the appointments, hide the last minute notifications of when I need to be gone. So I shared with just a couple people in my clinic. And this was the point where I found out that my secretary was going through pretty much the exact same thing, including miscarriage. Here I was sitting all by myself every day, working through these emotions by myself when the literally 15 steps away, somebody else was going through the exact same thing I was. I am here to tell you this journey does not have to be isolating. You do not have to go through this alone. I simply encourage sharing with one close person, family, friend, coworker, your best friend, somebody, just find one person other than your spouse that you feel you can connect with. And hey, I can be that person for you. I have been there. I just do not want you to feel isolated and alone like I did. I want you to know that you are not alone in this and that there are people here to support you. So back to IUI number three. So I am stimmed with gonal F, I'm feeling more bloated, I'm having more side effects for this cycle, and my trigger shot was to be at 10.15 that night. So, stayed awake, a thunderstorm started rolling through our community, and sure enough, the tornado siren goes off at approximately 10 minutes before my trigger shot is due. So, we get, and mind you, I must insert at this point, there is not tornadoes where I live very often. And my husband and I are both horrified of tornadoes. We are very fortunate to have a storm cellar to go to. But this was a situation where there was panic on top of grab your trigger shot, Tara. He's telling me to leave it. Leave it. Just leave it. I'm like, no way. This thing's coming with. I do not care what is going on. We are taking it with. So you guessed it. I gave myself my trigger shot for IUI number three with a tornado siren going off, but the excitement of IUI number three does not stop there. So we survived. There was no tornado, thank goodness. And we drive uh, 200 miles to the reproductive clinic at that time. So my OBGYN is 120 miles from where I live and my re reproductive clinic is 200 miles from where I live. So... There is a student interning that day, and I'm all about students. I am to this day. I was there one time, too. I am a big supporter of students learning from me. And so they were trying to insert the speculum. And now 
I am aware. I am well aware because I always have been a very hard insert for a speculum just because of the tilt and angle of my cervix and uterus. So they are trying. And I am bloated from the injectables this round. Like it is painful to the point where I have to like say, st can you please stop and ask my reproductive doctor to take over the situation? And she does, and she is bubbly and happy and so positive about this cycle. It's going to work. This is the round. I just know it. This is a good song on right now. They have speakers and music playing overhead. You know, I'm just feeling really good. And I appreciate the encouragement and positivity. But right before that, my husband and I looked at each other and were like, insert some cuss words. We're like, this is done. Like, this has failed. Like, we already felt so defeated from all of the circumstances we had coming against us this whole cycle that we already felt like it was done in our storm cellar. So you guessed it, IUI number three failed. And that was the point where we were like, we need a break. We both had just felt defeated and knew that for our mental and physical health, it was time for a break. So during this time, I had already known that I was accepted to a once in a lifetime health policy fellowship in Washington, DC with the American Association of Nurse Practitioners. Now, I don't know about you, if you believe in timing and signs and, and purpose and all of the things, but I do. So the day I literally stayed home from work and had a miscarriage, which insert, I highly recommend taking sick leave, bereavement leave, which places should be offering. My rural hospital offers bereavement leave for miscarriages. I took that day off and received an email that day that I had been accepted for this health policy fellowship. And working through dates and completion with the program of when I was actually gonna complete the fellowship, things had been changed and turned and mixed around. And I finally was going to be out there um, August through September and the day I was one of the days or the week I was out there completing my fellowship was September and it was on the due date of that baby so you're going to learn more in just a little bit why I find that significant a sign and my life purpose sign if you want to call it that so stay tuned so I went and completed this fellowship. I had an amazing time as a professional. I finally felt like I was getting back into something that I found joy and purpose in before going through infertility, which I feel is so needed at times. When you take a break, it's important that you go back to doing the things that you once did as an individual and as a couple what made you happy? What were your hobbies? What did you enjoy doing? What did you maybe put off or put on hold when you started going through infertility treatments? And get back into those if you need to at some point during a break. So during my time in Washington, D.C., I had time to reflect with my feelings, thoughts, and emotions going forward, but also time to communicate with my husband more. And we had decided that when I came back, we were going to seek a second opinion at a new clinic in regards to IVF. Now, insert a fun story. During this time, I also had admitted a patient to the nursing home here in my hometown as part of my job, and her son just so happens to be an embryonologist. That's a sign, right? I believe in signs. The timing of this could not have been more perfect as we were discussing IVF and what does that mean? And he pointed me in the direction of SART.org, which is a website that shows clinic statistics. He taught me all about IVF, all about what goes into it from not only an embryologist standpoint, but what it looks like from day one through the entire process. And we formed a ongoing friendship and communication that once I did come back from DC, I was able to connect with him again and we decided to switch clinics. And we made the move to CCRM Lone Tree in Colorado. And we saw Dr. Schoolcraft for our provider. And it was decided at that time, based on my medical records, history, and failed IUIs, that my diagnosis, in fact, was endometriosis. I finally could get rid of the unexplained 
infertility and put a name to what I had been going through. Not only did I need that as an individual, but my medical brain was finally at peace. So October of 2016, we had our very first appointment to confirm all of this. Now, we waited until January of 2017 when we actually had our egg retrieval performed. I had 17 eggs retrieved, 11 fertilized, and six we did send for CCS testing. From that, we had two healthy embryos, a boy and a girl. So knowing I had endometriosis, it was decided that we would do depot Lupron shots for two months prior to our transfer. Here is where I'm going to insert I am so happy and I praise the Depolupron shot for our success. However, I wish I would have known the severity of what some of these symptoms and side effects of Depolupron can be. It will put you into menopause. And one of the symptoms that really caught me off guard was the depression and anxiety I had from it. Looking back, I would have liked to know this and... I would have honestly started some medication for this prior to starting the shot. I do know it can take approximately 30 days, if not more, for some of those medications to take effect. So knowing that and looking back, I would have been more aware of the mental health side effects that can come from this. So I did Depo Lupron shots that January and February with a planned embryo transfer for April of 2017. So remember when I told you earlier how much driving I had to do? So the key is, as you may know, when you have lab work and ultrasound, it has to be same day results. The closest same day result location was 120 miles away. So prior to our first transfer, I had put on approximately 1,200 miles between recheck, check, check, recheck because there was some discrepancy in errors and concerns with some of my blood work. So between that, driving to an airport um, to find out that our first transfer would be canceled due to my lining and estrogen levels. Now I feel I could do an entire chapter or podcast on this situation because Something didn't feel right with me. My reading was always off and I being a type A medical provider, I took the disc of those images and I sent them myself to Colorado to have them read it and they always felt like my lining was good and where it should be and ready for transfer, but they had to go off of that reading. This is where I am going to insert an advocacy piece where I encourage you when you are finding these outreach clinics, if you have to do that, to find one that has trained ultrasound techs that do women's health or pelvic ultrasounds often, not just on the occasion that they are trained and know what they are doing in the specialized area because this once again is money out of your pocket it's an expense, or it's taking money from your lifetime insurance deductible and overall access to infertility care. So long story short, I had a canceled cycle. Now our airline tickets were refundable. However, I do have a cousin that lives in Colorado. I love snow skiing and we decided that my husband would stay home and I could go on a little girl's trip with my cousin to just distress and find once again something that I used to love doing prior to infertility and go and do that. So I had a wonderful weekend in Colorado skiing and came back feeling refreshed. And we then set forward with transfer number two, which did take place in May 1st of 2017. Now, it wasn't until I started going through IVF where I came across acupuncture, affirmations, and and meditations and all of the things, once again, I wish I would have had very early in this journey, but I did do electroacupuncture. So I started that actually in January after an ultrasound showed that I had decreased blood flow to my uterus. Now they thought caffeine could be a cause of this as well, but I did twice a week for four weeks electroacupuncture 
and this did show positive outcomes on an ultrasound that it had worked and increased the blood flow to my uterus prior to transfer. On May 1st of 2017, we transferred our only two genetically normal embryos, one boy, one girl. I found out we had a positive beta and instantly scheduled that ultrasound. Of course, I wanted more than anything twins. Fast forward to our first ultrasound and there was one heartbeat in there. Now, one would think that instantly all the emotions and fears and anxiousness of infertility would disappear. There's a heartbeat. This is wonderful, but it doesn't. I wanted twins and it was a loss. I truly believe an embryo failed implantation is a loss. I knew the gender. I knew that was a girl that I had lost. I think we often forget to acknowledge this as a loss for those that perhaps have been through IVF and experienced a failed embryo transfer. I think we could do many episodes in regards to the grief that goes along with this. So just know that you are not alone. Know that if you were also in my shoes, I truly believe you can be excited and happy for that positive heartbeat, but you can be sad and grieve the loss of the other embryo that did not implant. I'm going to do more episodes in regards to pregnancy after infertility because we also need to acknowledge that this is not always easy. For some it may be, and for others there is this level of anxiety, fear, and insert every type of emotion that goes along with being pregnant after going through infertility. So I knew early on I was going to have ultrasounds every two weeks starting at 12 weeks. This is because there was some concerns in regards to my cervix. Remember, I live 120 miles from ultrasound. So at 12 weeks on, I was driving every two weeks. I'd usually schedule it for about 7 a.m. I'd leave at around 5 a.m. so I could return to work after those ultrasounds. We do have family that lived in this town as well, and so I did stay with them from time to time, but more times than not, I would leave early and drive home right after those ultrasounds. Everything was going really well. There was no concerns with any of the ultrasounds or any of my OBGYN appointments. On two to actually November of 2017, I woke up two days before Thanksgiving to what felt like a gush of blood, and it was. I was supposed to be on call at 8 a.m. that morning. It was 7.15 in the morning. My husband works 30 miles away. He had already left for work, and I recall sitting there on the toilet just hearing blood pouring into the toilet, and looking down and seeing all of the blood on my pants and in the bed. I do vividly recall being numb. I, of course, have the medical monkey brain. I felt this fear like no other overcome me, yet as a medical provider who worked ICU, I worked ER, I am a critical care nurse practitioner as well and work ER, it was like the safety net went up and I knew I had to take action. So what did I do right away? I called another provider to see if they could cover my shift at 8 a.m. I then called my OBGYN, and she, of course, said, get up here immediately. Remember, 120 miles in the car one way. So I remember just grabbing my retainer. I am a faithful retainer wearer. And one set of clothes, I I don't remember much. I remember grabbing a towel to sit on and the rest was fog. I get in my vehicle and I start driving to pick my husband up 30 miles away and I get a call back from my OBGYN and she tells me to immediately get to the closest ER. She's sending a helicopter. So here's where my medical hat kind of goes back on and I try to talk her out of it because I know how long it can take to get a helicopter in the air, on the ground, to get me there. I knew I could drive faster and get there faster, and I was instantly met with resistance, and she told me, please, Tara, trust me on this. I need to know that that baby is okay, 
you need to get to the ER. This is not about you. This is about that baby. Woof, talk about a slap in the face check there, Tara. So I did exactly what she told. I went to the ER in the community where my husband works and a helicopter picked me up. You guys, guess who the doctor was in the ER? Do you recall at the beginning of my story where I talked about the locum or help out doctor, the older gentleman who was picking up a shift that day and I opened up to him for the first time as a professional about going through infertility and his daughter was also at one time going through infertility? It was him! I truly have to rush through this part because I get too emotional and I'm going to try not to cry in this episode. So needless to say, I was instantly greeted with warmth, comfort, hugs, an amazing staff took care of me. The helicopter ride, I'm not going to lie, I prayed the entire way. It at one point was windy and I could feel the helicopter shift sideways and I just remember the entire time praying. I was also very fortunate. One of the nurses was a friend of my sister-in-law's and I just had an all-around overwhelming, exceptional experience with the whole thing. I then stayed in the hospital for two days and what they believe happened was placenta abruption. It resolved. They never did find anything on the ultrasound, which is amazing and shocking at the same time considering how much blood there was. So two days later, I was discharged. We did hang around town. We did some errands. And right before we were ready to leave town, I saw some bleeding again. So back to the hospital, I went for another two days. And from that, they had wanted me to stay in the hospital, but my OBGYN is amazing. After a very lengthy conversation, we decided that I would just stay in town where I could be within minutes to the hospital versus returning home, which is two hours away. This was hard. I had nothing packed. There was nothing lined up for my job. I was lit literally just ripped out of my home and put in this position. So there's some more trauma to add to the whole story. I did end up doing this for four weeks. Right at Christmas time, I was able to return home. Everything checked out well. I did uh, twice weekly appointments, um, NSTs, all of those things. Everything turned out fine. I did go into labor naturally. You know, I mean, after everything I've been through, I thought I could at least have a glorious, wonderful, natural labor. Let's insert the emergency C-section to this story. Let's just end it with the emergency C-section that also was not planned. At the end of this entire situation, I am blessed with a beautiful son. He is now three years old at the time of this recording. He's healthy. We are blessed and truly grateful for having him in our lives. I remember sitting and holding him a few weeks after he was born and it hit me. It hit me like a slap in the face that I've never experienced before. And I sat there and thought to myself, what did we just go through emotionally, physically, financially, spiritually? It just sunk in and I thought to myself, what are other people going through? We had many blessings along the way. However, I thought to myself, there have to be so many couples sitting out there going through this, going through worse than what we just went through. How can I help them? And that was the moment I will never forget. I can see the chair, the time of day. I can see it like it was yesterday. I sat there and said, I need to turn my hurt into hope for others. I also realized how lonely I was in this journey. The lack of resources, support that I experienced. I remember longing to just be able to meet somebody for coffee and talk to them about things. This especially held true after I was actually open about my journey. Yes, I finally had my secretary who was going through it. We had each other. But 
I often remember wishing there was a support group I could meet up with. I did at that point have the Instagram support, which I love to this day. You can follow my journey on there still, Tara B. Fertility. However, I just remember wanting to meet somebody in person and have coffee and talk about things. So July of 2018, I reached out to Resolve, the National Infertility Organization, and I said, hey, I have some health policy background. Remember my fellowship in Washington, D.C. that I experienced during infertility? Insert this sign, as I call it, and reason for everything. I said I would like to somehow work to bring legislation forward in North Dakota to provide insurance for infertility. So fast forward to November of 2018, I started by reaching out to the local fertility clinic. They knew names of legislators who were familiar with infertility or personally were open about it. And I started just calling these individuals up. I am going to do an entire episode on this, especially for those who maybe are thinking of being the voice for your state or joining forces with states that already have legislation action in place. So stay tuned for that. So to fast forward through all of that, I did bring legislation forward in 2019. It did fail. However, from that, there was this outpouring of a local group of people who had shared their stories, shared their testimonies. All I did was start a Facebook page to bring people together, asking for people to come forward with testimony. From that, we did do an awareness walk the following year through Resolve and kept the momentum going. But what I soon realized was there was no actual organization for those with infertility in North Dakota. So why not just start a nonprofit while we're at it? Everlasting Hope was born from my hurt. Everlasting Hope is the first and only infertility nonprofit in North Dakota and as of 2020, South Dakota. Our organization brings resources and support through support groups, local resources. We have a nice web page where people can click on a variety of categories to see what resources are here to locally serve them. We do provide a grant to help offset medical expenses. We just started in South Dakota in July of 2020. So we also raise awareness to the public that infertility is a disease and the need for health care insurance coverage with this disease and also for fertility preservation. So we just completed our 2021 legislative session. Wow, was that a new experience from 2019. We had huge success. So once again, even though the bill failed, we still considered it successful because we gained so much support, momentum, awareness. Nine months prior to this legislative session, our organization, Everlasting Hope, did start working with insurance carriers to raise awareness on the need for this and how there's cost savings attached to insurance coverage. So we do a lot of outreach work in that way. In the future, I will do podcasts that focus more on the nonprofit and legislation, especially legislation. I am a huge advocate for access to infertility care and fertility preservation. And I have just so many things I'm going to share on that and guests coming up in the future. So stay tuned for that. I know 2020 is almost like a cuss word nowadays. However, it did do one good thing for me and it made me realize that my passion is helping people with infertility all day, every day, in any way I can. So I did launch a fertility coaching business. I'm so excited to be able to offer this level of care I do have a episode that you can listen to on the benefits of a fertility coach and all things related to that topic, but I want to walk away from this episode with the message that you are not alone, you are worthy, and your voice deserves to be heard.
Thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe. I have so much content to bring to you along with the occasional guest for these short, quick, weekly hopeful hints to help you through your infertility journey, no matter what stage you may be in. If you're ready to improve your reproductive health care and receive help to navigate the ups and downs, make sure to book your free discovery call with me today. Together, we can break through barriers and take back control of your family story. Join us next week for hopeful hints to bring you peace as you walk through your infertility journey.